Good morning. Um, thank you. I'd like to kind of shift where we go on the conference today to talk a little more about something in the IT industry we always talk about, which is the user experience. And yet we don't often talk about the user experience of cyber conflict. And so today I'd like to just put that into your agenda and, and have you give it some consideration. We live in an incredibly exciting time for the information technology. Um, our world is being transformed by the scale of cloud computing and artificial intelligence, the intelligence cloud, the intelligent edge, uh, advances in big data science, and, and the, the number of opportunities for us is incredibly exciting, from the prospect of curing serious diseases to making our commute to work much more efficient and pleasant. Uh, the, the range of interactions is, is tremendous. And yet, we're also at a time in 2017 where we saw a range of cyber insecurity events. Thomas Elvis yesterday gave us an encyclopedic listing of many of the incidents over the past year. Uh, but the cyber insecurity uh, has never been greater. Um, and we are in an arms race, a dangerous dynamic where the number of countries who are developing offensive cyber capabilities is growing. If the estimate is 40 with the, and anticipating going higher, we find ourselves creating shadow industries of people developing vulnerabilities for sale to the highest bidder. And this creates a dangerous dynamic for us all. Many of you focus on how a cyber conflict would play out. Um, there is the risk of a cyber conflict growing out of control. And there's also, sometimes in those calculations, we don't give enough attention to the people who are involved. Um, and so we set out to interview some of the people who've been impacted by the cybersecurity events of last year. Um, and so we've got some video of people in the UK and Ukraine whose lives were impacted. We want to give you a sense of, of their personal experiences. So please, let's roll the video. что наша страна находится в стадии войны, поэтому мы можем много что рассказать общественности, мировой общественности и показать все-таки лицо кибервойны. A global cyber attack. We've never seen anything on this scale. It can travel from computer to computer. Hospitals paralyzed, computers had shut down. Wanna cry is different. I think WannaCry is a great example of how nation states are impacting businesses and ultimately individuals as well. We had over 19,000 appointments cancelled and those are people who are worried about their um, cancer appointment or their appointment for an operation. I was diagnosed with a heart murmur, which was the start of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's a very serious surgery. I wanted my life back. After I'd had my chest shaved at six o'clock in the morning, the doctor looked very, not upset, but concerned, shall we say. And he said, we've been hacked. Uh, all our systems are down across the whole hospital. He telephoned me, obviously, and said, it's not going to happen. And he was, he was in shock. Suddenly, we discovered that a bit of our society, a bit of our social infrastructure could be switched off. Want to cry? It was a kind of a warning shot. The malware crippled computers across Ukraine. Perhaps the most sophisticated in a series of attacks taking control of computers and demanding digital ransom. The list of companies impacted around the world is growing. I think what not Petya represents is not just the evolution of the attack in terms of the methodologies involved but also the evolution of intent. 
Поэтому, чтобы понимать, что за два с половиной часа, с 10 часов утра, пол Украины уже было поражено. We have TV station who been on the air when their computers just died. You cannot receive cash in ATM machine because ATMs also were, uh, doesn't work. It was real shock for Kyiv citizens. 75% of my clients were affected by Peter. Some companies were destroyed totally. They didn't understand why they're losing their job. Everybody is just thinking, we hope this will never happen again, but I'm afraid this will happen again. One of the objective in the cyber attacks we face is disruption. To stop operating, to create significant burden to the life of the citizens, governments, businesses, where the cost of doing business or recovering is extremely high. In 2017, a lot was the same. Cyber attacks were happening, they were affecting organizations. What changed was the impact on our lives. It was the most awful time, because I didn't know what was going to happen now. Stop and think about what it means in real terms to real people. It isn't a machine you're affecting, and if it is, maybe that machine's keeping somebody alive. Ultimately, all of us pay the price when it comes to nations in particular who are attacking each other by using us as the means. What are we doing to come together? If we don't have this conversation now, when it happens and we all retreat behind walls, that is when this becomes a catastrophic event globally. And we need to do everything we can to at least talk about these issues before it happens. So what we, uh, um, um, let's see, where are we here? Uh, great. Um, the, the human element of cyber attacks is real. Fortunately, in NotPetya and WannaCry, we didn't have deaths. But at some point, there will be a destructive attack that, that will cause multiple deaths, and we hope we don't have to wait until that occurs for people to, to reconsider what we can be doing to, to protect people. In a world where we've got 28 billion connected devices in the next few years, our lives are increasingly connected and dependent. And at the same time, the phenomenon of state-sponsored attacks against not military and intelligence groups, but, but against people, civil society, schools, hospitals. And we need to change the dynamic. Um, and so if 2017 was a wake-up call for us, then 2018 is the time we need to respond. We at Microsoft, of course, we understand that we need to make our products and services more secure. We have over 200 cloud services and products in which we need to increase our security. And we've got not only 3,500 security specialists at the company, and we spend more than a billion dollars a year on security, data protection, and risk reduction. But we're, we're thinking about how to bring new technologies to solve persistent problems. And so we're working very hard at that. We understand that industry has responsibility to make it easier and less expensive for our products to remain secure over their entire lifespan. But we also realize that if we're going to change this dynamic, I mean, no company, not even Microsoft, can protect itself and our customers from a nation state military attack. It's just not the way it is. If we spend a billion dollars a year, the United States government spends six billion dollars a year on cyber operations, and we all know the asymmetry that it's much less expensive to attack than to defend. And so we need to change the dynamic. Uh, and so we're proposing to build on international law, 
to, to try to figure out where, where international law is, is not providing adequate solutions. And so there's thresholds for what is armed conflict. And, and so if international law is not addressing what's below the threshold of armed conflict, we need something there to address it. We can't simply say it's nation states are free to operate and carry out cyber attacks against people below the threshold of armed conflict. So we've been very focused on advancing cyber norms uh, and we embrace the very good work that's been done and the Global Commission on Stability of, of uh, Cyberspace uh, has done some very good work about norms to protect the core internet and most recently, protecting the technical aspects of electoral systems. Um, the G7 added to, to agenda this past year. Uh, Secretary Gutierrez is, uh, Secretary General Gutierrez, Gutierrez is bringing an initiative uh, at the United Nations, following up on the, the work that the group of governmental experts made and stopped short of a consensus report. Um, so th there is good work that's being done to try to advance norms, but I guess we're making noise because we want it to go faster. We want it to be more rigorous and focused on the people side of, of the equation. Um, we've also initiated a Defending Democracy program. Jan Neutze, who's here, who many of you know, is leading it uh, in Seattle, Washington now for us. Um, and we're looking for ways to protect the political process by bringing strong security technology to political campaigns and, and looking at how technology and business process can innovate to ensure that our electoral systems can be kept secure on an end-to-end -end basis. Um, we're also partnering with, with initiatives around the world focused on this. Uh, in three weeks, um, Anders Rasmussen uh, and Michael Chertoff will be co-chairing a commission uh, meeting in Copenhagen focused on how do we assure on a transatlantic basis that we can keep our elections secure. There's great work being done at the Belfer Center, which we're very happy to be supporting, and the Center for Information Technology Policy at Princeton, um, and the Oxford Institute, um, where there, is, there are serious people trying to think through the many level, levels of this, because we, there's nothing more valuable to us than our democracy. And if we can't protect that in this process, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's essential that the technology sector contribute to the solutions. Ultimately, it needs to be political leaders who step up. And so we think that the, uh, the initiatives are positive, but we've got significant ways to go. Um, we've also been focused on getting the technology sector to think more broadly about its responsibilities for security. We often think quite narrowly about making our products and services more secure, and we don't think enough about how do we keep the overall system secure. And so we've launched a tech accord on April 17. Uh, I believe there are 34 signatories at the beginning, um, where we set out four principles. One, we do need to make we need, as companies, we need to focus on stronger defensive products and services. Um, something we've said at Microsoft for some time, we're 100% offense, zero, oh, excuse me, 100%, <laughs> <laughs> we're 100% committed to not doing offense. <laughs> we're 100% committed to defense, and we don't, you know, 0% offense. And, and for industry players who provide broad technology to the world, that's an essential commitment. We're gonna focus on capacity building of our customers and the ecosystem so they can protect. Um, one of the lessons of, of the not Petya attack is our customer service doesn't scale 
to provide customer service to a whole country, right? We can help individual customers. We can, we can focus in on the key enterprises and getting them up and running. But when you've got an entire country that's been impacted by a ransomware worm, how do we respond? And we need to create greater capacity for these kind of events to be able to increase resilience. The fourth is committing ourselves to collective action. And we will be working together to take further steps to look at the broad ecosystem and the policy frameworks for how do we increase cybersecurity. We also know that we need to increase the accountability of cyber attacks. Now, we've talked about taking steps to create an NGO or some sort of governmental association under this broad concept, loosely uh, under, the, under the title that we've given it, the Dig Digital Geneva Convention. But we want to have governments accountable for their offensive cyber attacks against people. And it's too easy for people to hide behind the mask of, well, it's not attributable. And, but we believe it is. And we believe that private sector has a great deal to contribute to this. Now, we understand from governments that political attribution is an act that governments make. And yet the accountability side of the scientific data about what's happened there's a great deal of information in the private sector. And so, you know, we at Microsoft, we get, we get over a billion data points a day of what's happening on Windows devices around the world. Um, other companies get similar data. Uh, and so, when the United States government announced the attribution uh, on December 19th um, of the uh, WannaCry attack, um, they specifically called out that the private sector contributions and forensic analysis um, and the fact that Microsoft had traced back the attack to cyber affiliates of North Korean government as an important part of their attribution decision-making process. Um, and also the White House called out that Microsoft and Facebook and others unnamed had acting on industry's initiative, taken steps to disrupt the North Korean hackers. The private sector does have a role in this space. We understand governments have an important role, but we can do more to increase the accountability and we hope reduce the incentives for offensive cyber capabilities. And so I just want to close with uh, uh, where I opened. We talk about cyber conflict, but we don't think enough about the people. And, you know, it is people's lives. Statistics tell us one thing, you know, 19,000 medical appointments canceled in the UK because of WannaCry. But it's the human stories of the people who are showing up for surgery, who are missing their cancer treatment those are the stories that, that should motivate us to understand that we need to change the dynamic that we're currently in. We need to find ways to move away from the incentives for offensive cyber capabilities and create norms so that governments understand that they cannot take actions in cyberspace. They're going to have consequences for for people who are not part of their military and, and, and intelligence domains. And so I'd like you just to think about remembering all the people. So with that, I think we probably have time for a couple questions. Thank you for the excellent keynote. And now, questions, please? Any hands? One right here. Thanks, John. Uh, sounds like wise ideas. Um, you, um, you said that governments should be held accountable and so forth for a attacks against civilians. Have they been so far? I mean, let's take NotBeta, for example, a, um, probably in approximately 10 billion 
losses across the world attributed by governments to Russia, Russian security agencies, actually GRU. And what has been a price they have been paid? And they, um, you know, if it's just kind of, and you know, what do you propose beyond naming and shaming? Because if one thinks, I don't think you do, but if one thinks that naming and shaming does work, most people have not seen Lavrov in action. It doesn't. So basically, how have we been doing on that? I think it's an excellent point that you know, most people would agree, most international legal experts, that the NotPetya attack was a violation of international law. It was destructive and indiscriminate against civilians in the context of the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. And yet, when the White House made its attribution statement in mid-February, it used some of those terms, but it didn't say that Russia violated international law and how they viewed it as a violation of international humanitarian law, for example. And I don't think the Ukraine ever came out with a statement that this violated international law. And we think it's important that governments, I, you can on a positive side, you know, we have seen attributions more recently. Governments are coming forward with attributions, but they need to go further because I don't, you know, in an era where implausible deniability is the standard, um, we, need, we need more. But at some point, that's how governments, I mean, that, that is a space where governments need to figure out what to do. We can encourage it, but I, I think you're absolutely right. The government response is, well, a good first step of naming and shaming, that doesn't go far enough. Any more questions? We have time for two short ones or one difficult one. <laughs> Hi, sorry, I got the microphone right at the back. You won't be able to see me from the stage, I don't think. Um, Ross Morrison, I work for the British Foreign Office uh, doing cyber policy. Um, you've talked about the need to build on international law, but any binding international agreement that brings everyone to the table is going to take a huge amount of time to build and agree on. And, Earlier in the week at the Munich Security Conference, Kirsty Kalilaid, uh, the Estonian president, said any, so any agreement on cybersecurity will be obsolete by the time it's finished. And if it's not technologically relevant, then what's the point in having one to begin with? How would you respond to that? I think uh, we have to recognize that we are, even though we've had 20 years of the internet experience, we are just at the beginning of our digital civilization. And from a historical point of view, it may take, you know, we need to make progress on this because we're gonna be living in the digital world forever. And so it may take 10 years or 20 years to get to a fully binding agreement. And hopefully we'll get smarter along the way. And so I think it's an important aspirational goal to continue to pursue in the long arc of history, it's essential. In the meanwhile, there's lots of steps we can take. Um, and there are lots of discussions about how international law, everybody agrees it does apply, but how it applies and when it applies are, are debates that we can have now. And you know, the UK Attorney General speech set out some very interesting concepts, um, many of which I think most people would agree with, but there's some that I think that in industry we're not going to be able to agree with in terms of, you know, violation of sovereignty. Uh, sir, thank you for your time. Uh, Peter Kim, I'm with West Point. And um, my question is, what would you do to implement this uh, sort of cyber Geneva Convention for countries that have shown histories of not following international norms, for example, if North Korea, I mean, we've been slapping sanctions on them for a while now for multiple things, yet uh, it seems that, you know, until now, not a lot of progress has actually been achieved in that issue. Uh, or another example, Russia, uh, when hacking, will possibly state that it's just patriotic citizens that are doing the hacking, not the government itself. Uh, so how would you actually implement this uh, policy on them? Thank you. Um, I think there's always a problem in international law, and in fact, domestic law. We have laws against murder, but people still commit murders, right? 
Um, but, but setting the standard and making it clear to the community what's in bounds and what's out of bounds is still an important step. But there are things we can be doing clearly to make it to increase the accountability. There's important discussions about what are nations' obligations to look at offensive cyber capabilities, whether they're from cyber criminals or the state that take place within their territory. It's called the due diligence principle. And, and we think it's important to advance that because um, you know, we have a cyber crime team. And you know, we, we take down botnets using forensics um, and international cooperation and domestic legal process to go to court to be able to seize the domain equipment. Um, and in one of them, we, we recently, we, we mapped, we, once we take it down, all those botnets, when they're phoning home, they phone home to our sinkhole, and we can, we can map the IP addresses. And then you put it up on a map, and you'd think that the Internet's global, but in fact, you know, there's a line around the Russian border where it turns out that the malware would not impact computers that had Cyrillic set as the font choice. Uh, and, and so clearly there's something going on here and we need to be able to address that and get governments to, to do more. And the international community does bring important pressure. And there are limitations, no doubt, but it's the, it's, it's the best path we have. So. No more time for questions, unfortunately, but thank you once again, Mr. Frank, and also thank you, thank you for the fruitful cooperation throughout the years.